People, hello. What's going on? Look, I had to make a thumbnail. That's a very good excuse. Also, our stream quality now says full high definition 1080p. So, how are we looking? Is it good? So, Drift, little preamble topic. Okay. I was uh, trying to make sure my linebackers understood where they were keying. Um, it versus like 11 personnel, right? With the, your, your team, obviously. Yeah, li a live meeting, yeah. And then I saw the news that Sam Howell uh, was heading to Seattle. And I really thought that it was one of these fake Schefter tweets. Yeah. 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 That's quite the way to learn the news. It is. Uh, other, other subject... Someone got upset on Twitter because my date and time is a 24-hour clock with then the day, the month, and the year. Yeah, well, and to be fair, there are a lot of upset people on Twitter. So yeah. you might have just caught. True. And the person saying. who got upset about it is often very upset. Oh, really? Cam. <laughs> oh, of course, Cam. Yeah. Well, he's still not over the War of eighteen twelve. He's still recovering from that. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that what the Elmo thing's about? Yeah, it's just all that pent up rage bubbling out. <laughs> that makes sense. I hadn't um, put two and two together, but now you're helping me see it. Yeah. Benjamin, that's very kind. Best Seahawks pod in the game. Look at that. There we go. Benjamin, that's very kind of you. You got listen, chat. You guys don't have to suck up to us, but it does help. It is encouraged. Yeah. Um, and see, you now, be, Benjamin, when I see us, when I see your name, I'm like, ah, Benjamin's and, all right, you know. And chat, you can be mean to me. You can make fun of my eyebrows and, and everything. And but you can't be mean to Maddie because he will ban you from the chat. Yeah, just, like I, I have that, that power. Button. I will use it. Ryan, welcome. Good to see you. Good to um, see a lot of overloaders in here. Griff, you've been getting it on Twitter. Well, I invite it, so whatever. <laughs> you want it? Yeah, I don't know if I want it. Okay. Um, I don't mind it though. You know, I mean, I, 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 mean, I have no room to, no room to complain. I could just simply stop tweeting when I have an idle second. Every thought that comes through my head, because it's all I can think about. Right. I have um, noticed you are you're doing a lot of the uh, tweeting. It's um, yeah. That, it's it's the um, the the emotional like conduit for processing that you know um, the 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 God's gift of football. Jordan Brooks is no longer Seahawks. So, you know what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Okay, should we do this thing? Yep. Hit it, Maddie. Welcome to the Seattle Overload podcast, where we were going to watch tape of Jason Johnny Newton in the draft, but that'll have to wait because we have major Seahawks news to talk about. They've traded for quarterback Sam Howell. We'll talk about the terms, how that deal went down, and our take on it. They've also signed an inside linebacker, which would be good news, but there's some stuff to unpick there. And John Schneider went on the radio, and at first I, I, I've really tried to interpret his comments in a lot of different ways, and really it just comes off like he, they weren't in the room with him, and he just started kept, he kept talking, kept talking, kept talking, and said quite a bit. So there's a lot to unpack with that too. Uh, before that, there is, you know, some... Some more contract stuff has been reported. So it uh, turns out Leonard Williams' three-year deal is a $64.5 million deal, as we knew. But Brady Henderson of ESPN reporting that's a $24.9 million signing bonus, a $1.25 million 2024 base salary, which is fully guaranteed, a $20 million base salary in 2025, with $17.7 .7 million guaranteed for injury, which becomes fully guaranteed five days after this Super Bowl. And then a fifteen point eight million base salary in twenty twenty six, which I don't think will be guaranteed. 
He also gets $850,000 in per game roster bonuses each year. Griff, stop me if you feel you need to talk about any of this. And then, why does he yeah. Tyler Lockett? Restructured his deal, $8 million signing bonus, $4.66 million base salary in 2024, fully guaranteed, $10 million base in 2025, $5.3 million roster bonus due on the fifth day of the 2025 league year, $1.7 million in per game roster bonuses in 2025, and up to $4 million in 2024 incentives. That's also via Brady Henderson. And then finally, George Fant's deal, which I think Griff will have some thoughts on. That's a two-year deal with a maximum value of nearly $14 million with a $3.7 million signing bonus. That was reported by Aaron Wilson underscore NFL, who covers the NFL and the Texans for KPRC2. Previously worked for the Houston Chronicle and the Baltimore Sun. That's quite a lot of dough for George Fan. Obviously, we don't know the guarantees. I imagine a lot of that with how Seattle's operated is kind of heavy in the first year and push into the second. But it's a strong hedge when Abraham Lucas is a topic and Schneider was asked about him on the radio and kind of didn't mention Lucas at all, just mentioned Fant's ability to play guard and both tackle spots. Griff? Yeah. Thoughts on any of this? Where to start? Um, I mean, the I was a little freaking out over the Fant thing, but it's it, it's probably not a big deal. The, the year one cap hit, as I was educated on by many smart people, it's probably not going to be that high. It probably didn't prohibit them from being as active as they wanted to be in free agency. So, um, I mean, he was a, he was a competent starter last year. And if Lucas can't go, then he's in there, he's playing. So, but, uh, it's probably incentive laden, right? So he'll only be affecting the cap and it'll only be affecting next year's cap. If, um, if, if Lucas can't go that said, that's still the, 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 the grand potential of the deal, 14 million over two years is still high enough that that there's some commentary to be inferred there with regard to what they think of Lucas's availability. So mm -hmm. um, maybe the medicals really aren't that great. That's a little concerning. Um, so like if fan is your starter, that's, that's certainly better than their backup right tackle situation last year. But I do think that the best of Lucas, which we haven't seen a lot of, because he's such a young player, is still still clear as Fant pretty significantly. Um, Schneider specifically called him like a utility tackle left right thing. So um, hopefully it's only a right tackle thing, right? Um, but I mean that that they decided to spend their you know free agent O line dollars on a backup center and a backup right tackle, and I understand that you, maybe you couldn't can contend with Lewis's contract in Carolina. But if you're going to spend any free agent money, at least spend it on guard. Um, I think the only options out there right now are Risner, and that would honestly be pretty good. I mean, he's you can what's, ballpark. What's going on with him? Is I, he, know. I mean, I know he's tweeted kind of frustrated, but yeah, he's, he's down. He's he's down bad. He's he said he doesn't want a bag. He just wants starting guard money, and it's 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 slightly unusual to me that. Yeah, he did hurt his elbow uh, one time, but his health has been okay. Other than that, like he, you just look at his profile, um, where you know, like athletically, he meets like every single uh, metric, and then he had a good. You know, I he, think he was okay with the Vikings, right? Like a lot of the O line people, he yeah. matter like him, and uh, he's twenty eight years old, turns twenty nine in July. Maybe it's a length thing. I I don't know. Like it's, right. in terms of contract length. Maybe, yeah. So, I mean, it's him. And then the only other young guy that I can think of that's out there is Simpson. No, the Jets the Jets signed him. So he's off the market. And then the rest, it's the old guys. It's it's Zietler and Van Roo. And, and one year of Zietler would be fun, right? But he's probably looking, <coughs> excuse me, at a good chunk of money um, and at 34 years old. And it's just weird to... It's just weird to pinch pennies and other parts of your roster to just go spend that on the 34 year old. And it's like a one year thing. And what, like, what, what is really the, the rostering ethos? Are you trying to clear cap and, and prepare for the future? Or are you trying to compete right now? I mean, I think the answer is they're trying to do both. They're trying to be very flexible for 2025 and also fill a competitive roster 
But if you keep doing the, well, it's a reset year, it's a retool year. We've been saying that for like four years now. So at a certain point, go play ball. Like go get the roster out there, go play ball. It's not impossible. The The, the Dolphins started the offseason with like, I think they were barely under barely under the cap and they've spent a lot of money. Not, not that that's a good thing necessarily. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying the financial constraints, you can, you can play with that a little bit, you know? Well, I have some thoughts on that and it, it, I mean, we will talk about Schneider's radio interview, but I think this context is important. I've been wondering Griff, like, like you said that there's ways that they could have signed people to low kind of year one base salaries to keep them in the cap. And then, you know, backloaded the contract a bit more, spread it out more on the longer life of the contracts, right? To make it work cap-wise. In Seattle, if you look at their roster, it really does look like, other than uh, Williams, who obviously we read out his contract details, 2025, there's some guarantees, but the third year there won't be, uh, I don't think there's no guarantees in that year. There's no one signed on the roster beyond two years. Like, there's the rookie contracts, right? But there's no one signed beyond the roster in two years. And it brings me back to, I mean, maybe they just feel they want a reset year. Maybe they're not that, I mean, the, the whole offseason comes off like they're that not that in love with uh, Geno Smith uh, or like trying to build around him and they're kind of viewing him as the bridge as they retool the rest of it and then get the young quarterback in and they're maybe retooling the roster before they get that young quarterback, potentially. Well, but go ahead, sorry. But, well, the, the other thing is, it it gets me thinking about the sale again. Like, if the team is 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 going to be sold, are you just like, if it is, Bob Kondo to the Seattle Times reported. I think it was May twenty twenty four is the point where you know that's after that point that it, if the sale happens, it's going to be then. I mean, what if it's just sort of treading water this year? McDonald's given a six year contract. Pete Carroll left in very odd circumstances in terms of. How he he was like it's, it's Schneider's time now, but it was almost there was all, there was a kind of an inference that Schneider had this year, and then we'll see, you know, or that Pete could have had this year, and then he he'd have gone. Anyway, I, maybe it's too conspiracy kind of thinking, but th- there's a slight vibe which is a bit unusual with um, just how this free agency's gone and well, what you were it's... saying about like when how like are you going to try and build? This is very unseahawky right now it's... in terms of. Every year they seem to try and compete, and then this year there is slightly odd. They, they they keep playing musical chairs with like their core pieces. Um, not that you can pay everyone all the time, but they, I, I don't know. It's uh, they've it's an odd off season in terms of what it, the commentary on Gino. I mean, yeah, I get that idea of well, maybe they're not super confident in Gino long term. But then at the same time, they just went and spent $10 million this year on their fourth target. And it's on a two-year deal. So it's not like this is a four-year deal, $40 million, And he's he's there regardless of who the quarterback is. I mean, they might cut Noah Fant this time next year for all we know. So, I mean, that's kind of a short-term move itself. Um, and it's in on the offense. And then, But then, like, is it going to be undercut? So you're going to have to pass a lot because you just paid your fourth target $10 million, you're going to pass a lot anyway, but you're probably going to pass even more opening up your O-line to pass rushers that are going to tee off. And then what if the, what if the protection stagnates, doesn't improve? Well, you've lost, it's horrific. You've, you've lost Damian undone. Lewis. You, you lost Damian Lewis. So now you have two holes at guard. What if your protection doesn't improve? So what was the point of, t- you know, spending $10 million on your fourth target on a short-term deal? If, that spending prevented you from improving the old line. It's just, it's, it's, it's a little weird. It's a little weird. Um, bottom line, they've got, they've got holes. They've have, they've, if you're just comparing, if you're just comparing the players, player to player, and you're not looking at age, you're not looking at cap hit, et cetera, right? If you're just comp- comparing player to player, the, as far as guys they've replaced, they've gotten worse, slightly worse to significantly worse. So like going from Diggs to Jenkins is, the, it's not that much of a margin, but there's a margin there. I mean, Diggs is a better safety than Jenkins. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, if you, I mean, some Seahawks fans are incredibly negative about Diggs, right? 
Go ask Jaguars fans, like we mentioned last time, what they think about Jenkins. It's nothing but always washed. He's a bum. That's all you're getting right now. So, um, um, anyway, so then, and then, so there's a margin there going from, you know, Brooks to Dodson is a steep drop off. Um, and which, which is fine. You know, if, if the idea is, well, you're just not trying to pay a linebacker a bunch of money right now, get a competent player and then go draft your stud. Right. I, I get it. Um, but all I'm saying is of their exits and the guys that they have replaced, they have downgraded, like just superficially they have, and then they have even more holes and than they had going, coming into the off season. So, um, it's bizarre. Um, I think even if you're trying to reset, I don't think they've they've spent the totality of their resources efficiently. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. That doesn't mean they still can't have a master class draft, figure it out and everything. Um, and if they do, and like they're they're playing way above expectations, then you know we'll be sitting here breaking it down, celebrating it, right? Um, but I just saying to, to this point, the, the the entire picture doesn't doesn't you know excite me per se i'm not saying it worries me to a grand mm. degree but it's not exciting no i i concur and you know maybe maybe me talking about like a team sales going too far with it but there's something slightly unusual here now also unusual is you you're talking about the potential of having a master class draft well the seahawks have traded for washington commanders quarterback sam howell this is someone who they were very much rumored to be interested in come the NFL draft. Let me just check what you've messaged here. Yes, Griff, we should talk about that. Um, I, well, I kind of mentioned that. Anyway, this is someone yeah. they were rumored to be interested in with uh, Sam Howell. Uh, obviously, the commanders took him, uh, round five, pick 144. And I think as soon as that happened, Seattle traded down because that was who they wanted. And there was loads of rumblings before. I know Corbin Smith was reporting they were interested in him at the Combine that year. That was uh, that was their kind of guy. Now they've ended up with Sam Howell, and it's going to be hard for them to have a masterclass draft because Seattle, in this current draft, has two picks now in the top 100. Just two picks because what they've done is they've done a double pick swap. So they've sent the commanders their third round pick their higher third round pick number 78 and their fifth round pick uh, number 152 for the commander's fourth round pick the commanders picked high because they were bad but pick number 102 and a sixth round pick number 179 so they've moved down uh, 24 spots in, in the draft and got out of the third round they've still got one third round pick of course but they would have a second and it i don't know we'll talk about how in, in in a moment but Griff, from like a draft perspective, it's pretty difficult now. Like, what do you do at 16? Are they going to try and trade down and get back their second? I mean, it screams trade back to me, but maybe there's a really enticing player and then you get the same frustrating thing, particularly frustrating given the holes on the roster. And we've spoke about how their obvious needs perhaps don't align necessarily with the higher picked players, which is nice. Like inside yeah. backer generally doesn't go too high. Guard generally doesn't go too high safety generally doesn't go too high but <laughs> griff what, what are they doing in this draft <laughs> um yeah the, the the players that they need to throw a bunch of picks at are like day two players second third round and that's where they don't have a lot of capital right now mm. um so that first round pick they might need to convert into day two picks i think in a perfect world i don't know man I don't know because because we're talking about trying to get one of the blue chips to drop to 16 right um but at this point i don't know if they can afford to stick and pick they might need to trade back into the 20s but then i don't know who is there that is really enticing maybe one of the tackles that can convert to guard but the thing with these tackles is a lot of them are really tall there's really only two or three guys and there are like seven first round tackles right now only two or three of them i i think that you can fathom as a guard so you're playing with fire hoping they drop and schneider has traded back before and the guy they wanted hasn't dropped that was noah fant montez sweat in the 20 what was that 19 draft and they ended up sticking and picking oh and jerry tillery but he didn't work out um and they had to stick and pick for collier um they got lucky in the trade back with jordan brooks they got the guy that they wanted um 
maybe they wanted queen we'll never know but i mean i think that pick worked out in terms of just like what the play they got matched the eval you know Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a very real chance that the guy that's available to them if they trade back into the mid 20s isn't doesn't end up matching their eval just because of who's there um in fact i could i could even see i could even see them trading back into the 20s and then taking that pick and trading back again into like early early you know like the 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 high 30s or something Mm -hmm. um and the the other thing which is sorry griff well, I was just saying. So yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel good the draft strategy. I'm not sure. Um, and and the other thing with the draft, which is worth noting, is with uh, you know the influx of nil and that really taking off now, like really being a thing. The uh, you know you listen to all the experts. The day three, even after round three, potentially the draft is supposedly more of a wasteland than it usually is because a lot of guys aren't coming out early a lot of guys are waiting to be seniors so they can earn that nil money first knowing that you know if they're good enough they'll still get drafted fairly high because the same cycle will probably repeat itself so it's not really yeah uh, how valuable pick 102 is versus pick um whatever they gave up 78 there might be a bigger gap between those two things along with just two picks in the top 100 it's just not great so a double trade back could be a thing and then maybe you you then trade back up to get the right ledge going but yeah very interesting and uh wow yeah very 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 interesting so in terms of sam howell as a football player um Obviously, Seattle was rumored to like him. Uh, John Schneider, in his radio appearance, he mentioned how uh, his toughness um, kept talking about how he was a football player. Um, strong, keep keeping his eyes downfield, finding the open receiver, almost winning the game there at the end, talking about when the Commanders played Seattle this past season mentioned how young he is, the fact that he's younger than Bo Nix, the same age as uh, Jaden Daniels out of LSU and Spencer Rattler and Michael Penix. Um, Yeah, the football player thing is what appealed to him. But apparently he works his tail off. And he said also how they were kind of sweating that this morning. We're sweating out there, several teams involved with it, which explains why Seattle had to give up this type of pick swap, which looks a bit... The value doesn't look great, uh, given you would have thought how, you know, the commander signed Marcus Mariota. They're presumably going to draft a quarterback because of how high they're picking the type of quarterback draft it is. They picked two overall, right? You, you were thinking that how could almost, you know, be had for like a day three type of pick just on its own or like sixth rounder, seventh rounder. But mm-hmm. it seems as though other teams have ramped the price up or if, if they did exist and really the, the standout statistic from his season in 2023 along with the fact that he got benched and had 612 passing attempts and eight games passing over 40 times uh two games passing over 50 times which wasn't all just a bad defense it was like the enemy really leaning into quick passing game and like it was a kind of a monstrosity what they're doing um but he had 21 picks which uh, when George Schneider is asked at the Combine, what are some of the bigger deterrents or red flags in the evaluation? doesn't have to be something catastrophically bad, but when you're breaking down the tape and watching them, what are some of the things you don't want to see? He replied laughing and said interceptions is his first answer, which when you think Drew Locke had 15 picks in his second season in Denver is, um, is quite funny, really. But It is a little funny, isn't it? Isn't it? Um <laughs> Now, the other thing with Howell is he was sacked um, a lot, a league high 65 times, which you're dropping back a lot. But it's interesting to me how much that is him holding the ball and versus, you know, a bad O-line. ESPN's pass block win rate had uh, Washington as the 14th best in the league, so just above average. How much stock you put in that metric, I don't know. And then if you look at Howell's pressure percentage, he was pressured 38.6% of snaps, which isn't great, but is actually, per SIS, uh, 17th um, highest among quarterbacks. So among quarterbacks with at least 100 attempts. 
So not close to the league's highest, but in terms of the league average, it's above league average, like uh, the average pressure percentage for all those quarterbacks, not, um, you know, 16th out of 32. So interestingly, while he was 17th uh, in pressure percentage, 17th highest, um, his, sack percent, his sack percentage was 9.2%, which was ninth highest. So that does indicate potentially, and uh, quarterbacks can control how often they're sacked, that does indicate how it was uh, a, a bit of an influence. And some of the stuff I saw where, I mean, let me get up the Brady Henderson tweet where he, he reported from his Seahawks sources what they like about Sam Howell, arm talent, work ethic, smarts, toughness, ability to extend plays while keeping his eyes downfield. Well, yeah, he extended the plays all right, but a lot of the times he was just yeeting it up there and, and throwing a bad pick or, or taking a really bad sack the times I saw him do that. So, interesting that Schneider likes this type of quarterback because Locke had a bit of that in his game as well. It's clearly something Schneider looks for. Obviously, um, Howe has two years left and uh, two point, uh, just over $2 million that Seattle owes him for his contract. Still a rookie contract, but just a, an unusual move. Like I get really liking a quarterback. I get Drew Locke going to the Giants where Schneider said he'd been promised the opportunity to compete for a starting spot and a genuine competition. But for half a rookie deal on a guy you liked in the draft, but didn't wait to take until the you know you waited till the fifth round. Okay, Washington sniped you. But like, is there no one in the draft who you liked, you know, enough to just do it this time, or could you not have got well, like who's the Sean Mannion who could have come in this year? Like, is is how really that dude for you? I get you know, he's had, he's young, he's had all this NFL playing time, 18 games, given he started the last uh, week of 2022, but this is, uh, yeah, it's just a very interesting move. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm pretty agnostic about it. I, I see the concept behind it. I mean, they, they, they didn't really give up that much draft capital for it. It's just that they're, they're strapped for draft capital. And I, I would be stingy with it, but um, it probably precludes them from using one of their, third fourth round picks on a quarterback at this point they're probably not going to be drafting someone like Penix or Nix or or you know Rattler or Pratt whoever Travis um on day three or, or late day two um but I mean yeah like he is young they're viewing him as like a developmental like prospect invest in him see what happens if nothing happens who cares it's he's has a million dollar cap hit um you know, it's not hurting you. So I, I, you know, I'm all, I'm all for it. Um, I mean, he has a lot of growth to do as a player, right? Like his foundation is, it's kind of a mess, but he does something like he has an arm, like you mentioned, um, he's willing to throw, he's willing to anticipate and, and test windows. He just doesn't really do anything consistently. His feet are, are all, are all over the place. Um, he, he'll drop his eyes and, and and scramble when he shouldn't. And that's really more of a, mm. that's more of a symptom of just not reading the play out. Um, it's, it's like, I don't even say he turns, I wouldn't say he turns down reads so much as he's, as he's not reading the defense. He's not reading the play out to begin with. He's just kind of looking for something pre-snap. And if it's not there, he's doing his own thing. But then sometimes, you know, he doesn't do that. And you're like, okay, there's the there's a little bit of hope. Like in the Seahawks game, we saw that. He did do some stuff that game. Um, but so, um, you know, he's talented off-structure. Not necessarily a good decision-maker off-structure, but talented. So, but like, he's, what is he, 23, right? He's a young player. He needs to develop. And I'm, I think, you know, being around Gino, that's, that's probably one of the better quarterbacks to learn from either – directly or indirectly via osmosis so yeah um you know we'll see right there, there, i really don't see any harm here um and if yeah he, there's if no he, harm it's just the it's just the, the giving up the draft picks like they did right. because schneider mentions the washington picks high which is true they do they're the second overall pick in the fourth round but there's comp picks at the end of the third round so basically what they've done if you look at the uh is this using the the, the Rich Hill model or the Jimmy Johnson valuation model. Anyway, but essentially, if you were going to, say, move from round two, pick 50, down to Seattle's uh, round three, pick 78, which now belongs to Washington, right? That would cost you, per this valuation model, 200, um, 200 points to do that. 
Um, Seattle moving from uh, pick 78, uh, which is worth 200 points, down to Washington's pick 102 is uh, 200 to 92. So it's um, 108 valuation points. It's like, it's quite a big, I know you still get their pick, but it's it's quite, it's, you know, it's a meaningful drop. Like it's a really meaningful drop. Um, it feels too rich to me um, to, to do that type of thing when you're already asset um, limited anyway. Yep. Right. Now, part of the reason that hurts is Seattle's inside linebacker position, which uh, has been a much talked about topic uh, because it was Patrick O'Connell and John Rattigan as starters. They have signed a new inside linebacker. But before we get to that, John Schneider went on the radio and uh, gave a bit more insight into how the Jordan Brooks situation panned out. And again, uh, I, I would like to, you know, we could get kind of wacky with the interpretations here, but if we just take what he said at face value to start off with, he described how with the Jordan Brooks situation, who, you know, we'd have liked to have seen them sign, he said running the running back market and the linebacker market, they went much quicker than they have in the past. He said Miami stepped up and swooped in there and did a great job of acquiring him, that being Jordan Brooks. Um... He said, obviously, we feel like we have a need at linebacker and we'll be working to address that position as well as a couple of others. We keep going here. And then quite remarkably, when offered a way out of the question where he was asked about whether Jordan Brooks was like a scheme fit thing, you know, maybe like a scheme fit issue, he rejected that idea from Dave Wyman and said, really, it was the timing of it. We were working on Leonard Williams. Leonard's deal took a while. We knew Leonard's deal was going to affect all of free agency. They had a deal on the table and we just couldn't move as quickly as they could. They, that being Miami, had lost out on a couple guys that day, so they were moving quickly. We had prioritized Leonard ahead of the linebacker position at that point. It was basically like D-line ahead of a linebacker. You have to take emotion out of it because we love Jordan. We drafted him in the first and everything. You have to take emotion out of it and do what's best for the organization. That's what we did. So we prioritized Leonard. Miami moved very fast with Jordan. Again, they had lost on a couple people so they could move in a little bit quicker manner than we did. And that was on March 8th, this is. But going back to March 8th, John Schneider said on Seattle Sports that retaining Leonard Williams is a priority and they're currently in talks with his representatives. So it's not like this took Seattle by surprise. Obviously, there's a legal tampering window in free agency. There's a few days where teams can to talk to people and then, then it start the official free agency gets started. Uh, Griff, are you, are you buying that explanation at face value? And if you are, how, how much of an indictment is that of uh, John Schneider and the organization? No, I, I think he's just being diplomatic, trying to find a way to not speak whatever you know, and not speak to the real reason why they didn't either match the number or negotiate further with him. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you know what the deal is, you know, early on. So if, if they really wanted to keep him, they, they could have found a way is, is how I see that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't buy it. Well, what's your take on it? Yeah, it seems, it seems unlikely that like front office couldn't, you know, it's not the first time in NFL history that front office had two free agents they'd really like to keep. Um, that being said, the way he was talking was quite... Maybe maybe with Jordan Brooks, they anticipated that, but I don't think they... Like, I think they got caught out with how quickly the linebacker position went off yeah. in general. So, I mean, I, I, did Jordan I, I, Brooks... Go ahead, Griff. Well, I was just going to say really quick, I, I suppose it is possible that they were surprised that Jordan, maybe Jordan said yes without coming back to them. And maybe they, they were surprised by that. You know, maybe they thought, well, we gave them a number. We'll hear back. Maybe he, maybe Jordan hurt, got the number balked at it. Miami said, all right, we'll give you this. Yeah. You know? I, I think some of that's gone on there. When Schneider says that they swooped in, 
that uh, that yeah. implies that I think they're wanting to hear back from Jordan Brooks and try maybe make something work. And then, I mean, Brooks signed a three year, twenty six point two five million dollar deal. This is per Aaron Wilson of KPRC two, sixteen million dollars guaranteed, eight point three seven five million signing bonus. Uh, with uh, $1.125 million of that uh, salary guaranteed in year one, which, um, yeah, they, they could have they could have done that if, if they'd wanted to. But I think the fact that they've been caught out by how quickly the rest of the linebacker position went, I think you definitely take that at face value. And that's kind of an indictment because it's not the first time we've heard John Schneider say something like that. Like, <laughs> he said that about Edge edge group right and that's how you ended up with the lj collier pick griff right agreed do do you remember that situation i do remember that situation yeah so situation no Uh, so schneider also in the radio interview said how they'd learned lessons about reaching again and how they're not going to force the need uh, he described Pharaoh Brown as a top two, three blocking tight end of the National Football League. Um, said how D. Eskridge would have been uh, probably let go if the Pete Carroll coaching staff had remained, but they're giving him a second chance uh, in Seattle, who's an extremely explosive player of the ball in his hands. Um, said, of, said how they'd have loved to have had Damian Lewis back. Um, but some teams build their teams in different ways every single year. And in Carolina, they're building it inside out, which is their prerogative. I'm sure they're excited about the two guards they've signed. How is Seattle building their team? That's a very good question. Yeah, how are they? I mean, I guess you could... I mean, it's... I don't know building, like, is the right word, because... the Shuffling. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it's currently built as in, um, I mean, it's it's built outside in, but I don't think they're building building it outside in. It's just presently built outside in. Um, yeah, it's a little odd. So, which is weird because the, the people are. T- I think some are taking this as commentary what McDonald values values or whatever. But like the Ravens' defense is built inside out, so. They yeah, have good corners, lot, don't get me wrong. But a lot of good defenses are. They 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 had they had multi, they have got a plural uh, multiple first round picks tied up in their linebackers. They had a 17 million dollars safety. They had another one that they drafted in the first round. Like it's built inside out. We have to right, we have to remember, like I'm saying this with the full with the full confidence that Mike McDonald was the right hire and is a great coach with a great scheme. The second half of the Ravens season, as we know, their run defense regressed bottom five. Their th- third worst run defense, the second half of the season, the Ravens did not as bad as the Seahawks, but I'm just saying, even with all their talent that they had, it still was bad. It didn't matter because they had one of the best back sevens in football, particularly the best, like interior of their back seven, their their interior four or five of their back seven was extremely good. The Seahawks right now, as it stands, probably bottom three interior of their back seven, maybe bottom five with, I don't think a realistic chance of being better than like 20th with the draft goes right. Um, So they, they don't have the players to compensate. So I'm just saying like, McDonald's McDonald's scheme and his coaching isn't necessarily enough to have the run defense fix itself permanently. He he himself has not had a full season of good run defense. The first half of 2022 was bad. Second half of 2022 was good. First half of 2023 was good. Mm. And it didn't matter in 2023 because in the second half, because the pass defense was so good and they were generating so many turnovers. Mm. Seattle, I don't think is going to have the juice, the talent to do that. So, I'm just saying in terms of what we're setting ourselves up for, I don't know. It, it doesn't, it doesn't feel great. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> rambling here, but then also they're going to, they're going to find some guys, right? They're going to find some guys. And then by those time, by the time those players come of age, they have another three year deal. back. What, no, hold on though. Hold on. When are they going to find the guys? Okay. Let's say, let's say they nail it. Say they get junior Colson and say, you're in what, when with what pick, after they 
do their little trade back song and dance. So they trade back twice, and then Junior Colson just happens to be there in like the top of the second. Well, let's, say. let's say you're you're literally you're drafting like it's um one of these mock draft simulators. I'm just saying, man. It's tempting. What well, all I'm saying is they're they're doing their thing again where they're going to bring in the way Schneider is anyway. They're going to bring in replacements for quality players or maybe aging players, find their guys, they're going to find their stride. And then their current players that they're paying, they've backloaded their deals again. By the time they reach a certain age, people are going to look at their age, they're going to look at their cap hit, and they're just going to decide they're washed even when they're not washed. Well, it's, 20, it's, it's 2025, isn't it, is the year? It's, it's supposed to be the year, right? But then what if no, you... No, but like, if, it's the year that all the contracts just disappear. Uh, is it? Are you saying when they decide to cut them? Yeah, when when like the 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 they they even can get out of the deal, or guys right. just aren't. But then and the then they're paying rate. right, but then they're they're paying them a bunch of dead money, and then that limits what they can do in free agency. But they're like, well, they had to get out of the deal, and they go get half measures to replace. Well, no, them. well, look at the look at the guys though they've signed this year. They're like weird two year deals, which aren't two year deals, or. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm talking like I understand the locket restructure, but like I'm talking about Leonard Williams here. So they've yeah, he, but he's the one. He's the only guy, and his third year of the con, his third year of the contract Griff, is not guaranteed. True. So that so, means they're going to cut him instead of trying to restructure. <laughs> well, so you'd hope they they'll be him, trade him. Maybe maybe trade him. Well, what I'm saying though is that if you keep backloading old players. They can still be good on their final year, but the cap hit is ballooned so greatly that they're not going to want to pay him on, pay him at that cap hit. If you invert that just once with one of these guys, they can still be bringing value relative to their third or fourth year cap hit. Um, I'm just saying it's frustrating because then they're like, all right, as the younger players come of age, the ve- the veterans bottom out of the roster, and then it's just this constant seesaw. But they don't have you any. Like who are who are the? This is the thing though. Who are other than Leonard Williams and Tyler Lockett? Who are the old veteran players on the roster who who are like a problem after twenty twenty five? How old is Uchenna? Is still young, isn't he? Ah, uh, yeah. Um. No, you're right. I mean, it's not. It's not like there's a. It's not like there's a. A large number of these guys but this at the is... same time they'll be making a decision with jenkins they'll be making a decision with um with fant um what, what, what if they i don't know man i just i'm i'm just i i all i'm saying is i can already see what's going to happen with leonard williams um whatever i'm winding though okay <laughs> now Schneider also on the radio and Soupman posted it in the comments. He, he was preempting my point. So obviously guard is a need for Seattle, but Schneider on the radio in the finishing statement where uh, Dave Pearson of Seahawks PR had been talking so long that Dave Pearson started getting in the camera shot and leaning over. And I don't know if he was like, "Hey, you've like been talking for three minutes here, buddy," or <laughs> or what? <laughs> I don't know if it was a signal. Maybe he's just leaning over for some reason. Anyway. Right at the end, Schneider said, guys get overdrafted at that position, talking guard, and in my opinion, they get overpaid. And if you want to get a conspiracy theory about it, on Seattle Sports, the camera image went off and um, they flashed up the thumbnail while he said the overpaid bit, which uh, maybe they didn't want a visual of Schneider saying that. <laughs> but uh, like half joking aside, kind of hints that they, they wouldn't take, they don't really feel like, that strongly about guards. They, they, we kind of know that, but <laughs> Schneider's shown that. I don't think he's willing to really pay guards, which good, good for him. Yeah, um, the guards so, were paid this year. Like they, they did get given big contracts, but the cap so, went up. So then you, you also wonder: Does he even view right guard as a whole? Is it just going to be Bradford? Going to be over Timmy Bradford, this this Lucas Fant Frankenstein thing at right tackle, and then a, a, then a third round left guard. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Invest in the trenches, as they say. Yeah. 
yeah so how are they building their team what is their prerogative um yeah okay so final news the seahawks have a new inside linebacker now i don't think we have the terms on this yet but after hosting him for a visit seattle signing tyrell dodson uh Dodson, an undrafted free agent in 2019 out of um, Texas A&M, was with the Buffalo Bills. Um, he played some games for them. He also had a thing in uh, 2019, uh, an incident where in September 2019, the NFL suspended uh, the rookie linebacker for six games as a result of an alleged altercation with his girlfriend at her home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um he reached an agreement with prosecutors to defer a domestic violence charge of disorderly conduct, disruptive behavior fighting. He agreed to enter a diversion program and must also meet other conditions to have the charge cleaned from his record. He was scheduled to have a restitution hearing in November and has sentences hearing set for September 2020. That was um, per AP News back in September 2019. Um. The altercation happened in May 2019, and Bill's general manager, Brandon Bean, said that a team investigation found no credible evidence of Dodson committing an act of domestic violence, and he added the team's pre-draft evaluation of Dodson showed no history of him getting into legal trouble. So there's the there's that, which um, isn't great. And obviously on this podcast, we talk about the players, and what they do on the field, but that's relevant detail, which may make some people uncomfortable, particularly with the infamous Schneider comments. I think it was 2014, uh, yeah. which get rehashed mm. whenever something like this happens. I think that was 2015, but yeah, the, the, uh, the Clark, the Clark draft. Um, yeah, but I was referring to before when they said they'd never add oh. someone to the team who'd put hands on a woman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and for it's worth, sit, you know, if it might not be worth much, uh, but Dodson hasn't, I don't think, been in trouble since. And I saw a video of him buying presents for single moms this past Christmas. So, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, people have the right to feel however they feel about that, right? I don't yep. think anyone in the NFL would see that as a reason not to sign him, which is, you know, indicative of where the NFL is at with that. Um, believe in the concept of second chances, but they're not just doled out like candy that said, if he went to, if, if he was in a diversion program and who knows if that's just, you know, like, you know, hand waving away. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we know where Schneider stands and all that. And that's kind of more airing on the side of, he doesn't really care. Um, but, you know, as a young man, hopefully he's in a different place than that, but, uh, since since then but you know we, we can only speculate um from where we're sitting so beyond that it's yeah i would just say people have the right to feel however they feel about that yeah so in the way that we do moving on from that pretty important stuff um dodson is a player uh so he's now 25 years old turns 26 in june uh he he was waived and then re-signed to their practice squad after finishing his suspension. Mainly a special teamer for them, but then in 2022, after signing a one-year extension, managed to start three games uh, on defense. And then in 2023, after signing another one-year contract extension, he started 10 games after Matt Milano went down. So I preemptively watched him in 2022 when he got some reps as like a mic in like a 4-3 over, which if you think of Seattle and what they're going to run most of the time, it's going to look like a four four down front with an over thing and a, and a mic middle linebacker in the middle of it all. There was some interesting stuff. He moved pretty well. He ran well. The way he could uh, process like stuff going back across the line of scrimmage and adjust his run fit, adjust, adjust his coverage and process all that was very impressive. And then he was pretty fluid, like um, bailing in his in his zone drops and 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 adjusting. The issues were stuff over the top of him or his zone, or just picking that up. And his just feel for that and instincts were just off. I don't know if you can learn that. 
uh, you probably can a bit with coaching, but I think he has all the kind of movement stuff Mike McDonald's looking for. I know he's got short arms, but he tested pretty okay. And uh, yeah, I don't know if he's a Mike or a Will. Like he 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 played more Will in, in most of his action for Milano, right? But I've seen him play Mike and. He looked okay, even though he's only 237 pounds. He's just over six foot, so he's quite dense. But, uh, Drift, you, you've watched him and you, you tweet out some absolutely abysmal clips. Um, I watched I watched his two highest rated coverage games, I think, anyway, for PFF, just to see like anything like splashy stands out. Um, I, I think the, the, the whole like theory behind him is I mean, we're talking about like one of the three. NFL linebackers that are even left in free agency, right? Um, like the theory behind the pick is get competence at will. Just get a guy that is not like a hole in your defense um, and then try to find your stud at Mike or whatever. Um, what I see watching him is, is is pretty similar to you. He is good against the run. He actually keys like pull scheme like really fast. Yeah. So he definitely does his, pull, his um, tape study. He goes – he goes underneath blocks sometimes, but only when it makes sense to. So it's like he's taking a shot. Like he kind of he knows what he can get away with. He is comfortable with contact. And he can like change his like his pad level and hip level while moving, which is just like a movement skill that just so few guys at 240 pounds actually have. You just kind of see him dipping under guys and stuff while maintaining speed. Um in coverage, it's I, I don't characterize him as a good coverage player from what I saw the month, the two games that I watched, but he is really aggressive with what he sees. So if you can kind of be like point and shoot with him, he can execute. Um, when he is playing a hook, like it, when there's a high, when there's like a, when there are two vertical routes, two routes stemming and one sits down, he aggressively squeezes the first one that sits and then he'll get a, something wrapping over the top of him. Um, and so <laughs> he'll just, he's kind of, I mean, I think it's good that there's an aggressive nature in there. It just seems to be like redirected in a way. He just basically needs to learn how to zone drop. I think, like you said, the feeling stuff over the top of him is kind of lacking. Um, I think running in a straight line, he, he can handle, he, he did have some good reps where like he's the weak side quarter flat player. And then his running back be- goes strong to the trip side. It becomes a, you know, a three, four push and he's pushing, mm-hmm. he's pushing with, and he pushes to the final four. And it was actually a good rep against Travis Kelsey. It was just a spot drop, but it shows that like, Hey, he knows that he's alert to his keys and stuff. Um, but you know, like the down in down out coverage stuff isn't there. But then the other thing is like, he's rarely asked to do high value things. So you look at his PFF grade and it's like a 90. It's just garbage. It's just well, nonsense. not and only, when, not only is his PFF grade a 90, but the uh, official Seattle Seahawks Twitter account tweeted out that he is that Seattle has signed PFF's number one graded linebacker. It's not even misinformation, it's disinformation. Because even if that was accurate, it's it's not informative at all. It, it, it's like looking, because PFF grades are essentially a percentage of successfully uh, the, per- the what percent of your plays do you do something good in is basically what they're measuring. So even if those are being measured correctly, it, it still doesn't indicate value. And the PFF grade isn't necessarily trying to convey value, but it's three digit number. It's all you have for a guy you haven't watched. It's like looking at like a, an, an NBA big of four or five mm. and their only points are on putbacks. So they have a 65% field goal completion or, 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 or mm. field goal percentage. And then looking at that number and going, wow, they need to feed that guy in the post because he's making 65% of his shots. <laughs> when he's dropping to the flat for 90% of his snaps and the running back's just flaring out and he's getting positive grades or occasionally the rest of the coverage will force the check down and he goes and tackles it. So he gets a, a plus one. He gets five of those a game. He comes out looking like Fred Warner in the PFF grading system when he's done absolutely nothing of difficulty it's like it's really the same thing as bobby wagner's rams campaign Mm. where the rams just had it not drop deeper than five yards Mm. you know every game all game 
all season and he's got a 90 grade. It's just it's just nonsense. It's not informative I mean, if at all. You, if you want to watch Dodson, uh, the game I'd recommend is that 2022 game against Pittsburgh where he plays in the middle and he's not just playing the flat. He's like having to do some, like the middle of middle field open coverages and stuff. There's also, if you just search him on YouTube for like a breakdown, some guy broke that tape down. Now, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all that guy's saying, but you know, take it what you will. But th- there's some good clips that a guy selected to show show his stuff. So there you go. Right. That, that's that's us. Uh, yeah, linebacker is still a big problem. Linebacker is still a massive, massive problem. Like Dodson is a, a very much like being thrust into a position that I don't even think he'd have thought he'd earned. Um, and I think part of part of why he signed late is maybe this incident, um, but also part of why he signed late is because of that reason too. Um, I'm interested to see the terms with it. Devon White signed for seven and a half million dollars today to the uh, <coughs> Philadelphia Eagles, so we weren't too enamoured with him. But I yeah um, I don't know who what who else are they who else is there now? Cody Barton. <laughs> Yeah, Cody Devin Bush. <laughs> Devin, well, he's a Brown now. Is he actually? Yeah. All oh, right. Great. I'm sure it'll be like one year, three million. Um. So I have go. high hopes for Patrick O'Connell. He I uh, went back. We watched the mic tape. He 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 made a tackle in the preseason. I mean, so I mean, Patrick O'Connell like is a linebacker, bro. Like he, he, the only thing is that he runs a four seven five, probably. That yeah, that is, yeah, that is but a he, thing. He can key, he gets after it, he can hit, he can tackle, he knows what he's doing. He just runs a four seven four eight. What, um, am I? What people are putting Devondre Campbell? Is he even an inside backer? No, he is, but he is he. Packer, Packer, Packers people are are not are ha- are happy he's gone. Um, I I thought he played some outside as well. Or was that just because he's a will? Maybe he did, but I think he's a stack behind the line of scrimmage guy. Okay. Um, the, the the other the other consideration with Dodson is I don't see a, him putting him at Mike at all. So you have to draft a Mike, and that probably puts you out of drafting Barrett because I don't think Barrett can handle Mike. He probably could, but I think McDonald wants a, a guy with a little bit higher density. When he is probably... chat be chat be useful? When is Michigan's pro day? Uh, the twenty second, I think March. 22nd. Oh, Griff, you know that? No, I looked that up because I was thirsty. Twenty second of March. <laughs> Maddie, I need you to watch Jalen Ford. Yeah, yeah, Monjombo, I'll watch him. For, I mean, Ford to me is just like sophomore year junior Colson. Or like he's, he does some things well, but then it's kind of a mess uh-huh. at the same time. But then the traits are there and it's like coach him up. How's his, how's his focus? How's Ford's focus? He, he, he's a, I mean, he's a, got that football player mentality. Okay. Like he's, he's like, let me go hit something. Um, he's not a sitting duck. That's the thing with him in coverage is that. He has lots of coverage reps, like spot dropping. He does some. He's always trying to do something. Is the thing. Mm. It does. He just doesn't mean he's always right. What What type of animal would you compare him to? Like a raptor, or? <laughs> I'm not gonna. Um, all right. In, in a in a positive light, a. Is Ford a raptor? He's a. Um... No, I won't go there. Okay, we'll we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Okay. Final news: Kenny Zuckerman, agent for the NFL of the NFL for Priority Sports, he reported that Jake Curran has agreed to terms with the Chicago Bears. So yeah, Seattle. I mean, George Fant over Curran is an upgrade of right tackle, but it costs more money to do that. So. You'd think, at least. Okay. Are we done here? I think we're done. 
Excellent, excellent. Chat. March the 22nd from Tate on, on Michigan's Pro Day. Thank you for the confirmation. Appreciate that. Hey, please do follow Griff on Twitter at CMikeSpinMove. Follow me at Matty F. Brown. Superman, we talked about Dow Taylor's contract details. Or did we? No. Superman, there you go. Look look at you. That's that's some uh that's some good chat behavior. So Dow Taylor was signed to a one year Griff three point one six million dollar deal. <coughs> he got a twenty K signing bonus and a three point one one six million dollar non guaranteed base salary. He could also get $350,000 in incentives if he gets a certain number of sacks. Seattle could have tendered Taylor for $3.116 million, but this bonus and ability to earn the incentives is basically saying thank you to you, and you could have been, you know, if you weren't hurt in 2020, you'd be hitting free agency now, so here's a thanks. But it's non guaranteed. So if he gets, I mean, is the tender guaranteed? I don't even know. I don't know. Um, I'm intrigued by them wanting to bring back Taylor, though. Yeah, the tender would have been. Yeah, the the cost of the tender is is debatable because. I've seen three point one million, but I've seen it could have been as high as four point nine million dollars. Um, yeah. Ta- what you're intrigued by Taylor Griff? I'm intrigued by them wanting to keep him. Right. That's what I'm intrigued by. I mean, you just hope that he just takes off with McDonald. <laughs> having good pass rush looks on passing downs and works him in. Yeah. Like, does he trust him for the coverage stuff? Surely not, right? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the, Mike Morris is probably going to play a good deal of edge. That's the other thing. So he might be viewed as the fifth edge. Um, so and, who, then, who, and then Taylor's truly just a depth pass rusher. So who's the Sams and who can play Sam, like the guy who drops more? Mafe and Owosu will interchange though, because they're, they're not going to play enough base for it to matter. Derek Hall can do it. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Derek Hall, I forgot about him. Um, a lot of people mentioning Van Noy's uh, in- improvement, but like, it, really, why he was so good is he he got really good at like doing inside moves and inside games. Yeah. I don't know if Taylor's ever going to be able to do that. We'll find out. Okay. I don't think we'll have any other news to talk about this week. So we'll probably be back next week with, unless Seattle does something crazy, a Jason Newton tape breakdown. Um, but until that point, follow Griff on Twitter at Mike Spin Move. Follow me at Matty F. Brown. Superman, <coughs> thank you very much for uh, letting us know about that, that detail. And, yeah, follow the pod at Seattle Overload where you'll find out when we're next going live. Please do like the video, comment what you want to see from us, subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening or even if you're not listening, just subscribe to the podcast on your podcast app and give us a five-star review. Cindy. What's your question, Cindy? (laughs) There's a lot of pressure here. Ah, that's a good question. Thank you, Cindy. Schneider on the safety position and signing Rayshon Jenkins says Seahawks are going to play more too high this year and split safeties. Would this have been a factor in letting Diggs go? Well, Cindy, the thing is, uh, kind kind of in the, um, you know, Quandry Diggs is thought of as a high safety and his best work comes in the middle of the field. So one high staff playing the post. But in 2021, Seattle ran a lot of too high coverages and split safety deals. 2022, they did until they stopped being able to stop the run. 
uh, they kind of like the last three, four games, they kind of clamped down a bit. And then 2023, when their run stuffing became an issue, they kind of stopped being as too high as well. So they've been trying to do this too high split safety thing for a while. Um, I don't think really that's why you let Diggs go. Like he can play a quarter, he can play a deep half really well. I think there might be something to it's easier to find the two high split safety type safeties. Like think about, um, you know, uh, how rare Earl Thomas's skill set is, and then how rare the guys who, or how long it took Seattle to find a good replacement for Earl until they got Quandre Diggs, and then how it seems that there's all these safeties still available who have played really well in split safety systems. Like it's generally, generally like in simple terms, you're covering less area of a field. But um, Griff, do you have any thoughts on that? Because Schneider's mentioning that is kind of frustrating given playing more too yeah. high this year in split safeties isn't really, like it's not that accurate. Like McDonald's still plays middle field close. They might have a bit more flavor and disguise to it if they're good, but. Yeah, um, agreed. And then also, John also said in that interview, today that Jenkins comes from a system where they don't play very much too high. So in yeah. terms of, so in Is terms he... of like on that note, it speaks to how, if you're a good safety, you can kind of do it enough. You can do all of it, but just saying that you moved on from digs because of the scheme change, but then to then go sign his replacement coming from a scheme that didn't do those things that you said you're going to do. There's no logic. There's no train of thought there. That makes sense. He's just kind of just, bullshitting in the interview and the Jags when I watched Jenkins and it was only two games but they played a lot of middle field open and split safeties and a lot of disguise yeah whatever so, I mean I mean, they kind of used him all over I mean Diggs was a fit Jenkins is a fit just Diggs was old and expensive and in Schneider's view was... Diggs is in Schneider's like GM brain I'd suggest that Diggs has paid that much money because of what he can do in middle field open middle field closed one high coverages Mm. and he probably thinks you can get almost as good safety play for cheaper in the split safety stuff. Uh, Cindy, thank you for the question. Good question. No, it doesn't mean more two-man, Nate. just means cover four, cover six, maybe cover eight, but mainly just quarter, quarter, half, and, and then different types of cover four where if you've got a particular issue, you can check your coverage into something where the corner plays slightly different and the slot guy plays slightly different, but it's still zone match yeah. coveraging. But, but when, when like cover three, cover four, you don't need to worry too much about that in terms of Woolen because still 80% of what he's doing is a man technique. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll let him press and, and a, a, even a, even an off cover four technique generally is you, like off man or it's like a bail zone. Like it's the yeah, same. But, you're still accessing what makes a woman special in your zone calls most of the time. It's just the rare events where you're not, and then he gets caught with his own, a pure zone assignment where he's had trouble, but he can still get better at it. He's still a young player. Mm. Uh, so Cindy, thank you very much. That's a, that's a kind of you. So there's a super chat function on YouTube, which might be too much to work out. Like, I don't know how to do that. Or there's a, um, in the in the description there's a stripe donation link stripe is what we use uh, for donations it's, it's legit um, you just click the link and uh, you should be able to enter your card details but thanks cindy all right griff closing wisdom for people uh no closing wisdom oh i have no, I have no wisdom that's, that's reminding me that's reminding me hmm. though Cindy's uh, Cindy asking that question and, and then asking this, the follow-up on donations. Long Why is it not showing up? Pregnant pause. Thank you, Cindy. That's very kind. Oh, Cindy, thank you so much. <coughs> um, we had a, we had a, we had a donation Griff and it's disappeared for some reason. Let me uh let me dig it up. Du, du, du. <laughs> no, not on that video. <laughs> oh, there is there is one thing we could bring up. <coughs> okay, one second. All right. Let me let me find this uh this is 
I know who it's from, but I wanted to make sure. So Dan, Dan Chu, long time supporter of the podcast, uh, donated $20 on our previous podcast saying, buy yourself a bag of fresh roasted Poverty Bay Cafe coffee beans, Griff, then tell Matty how good it is once you're wowed. Ralph's light roast and espresso roast are my personal favorites. Thanks for all the ball knowledge and humor. Cheers, boys. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Very kind. Wow. And then Fanon, thank you so much. Thank you, Fanon. If you if you have a question, the floor yeah. is yours. But but um, thank you very much, Griff. Come on, what's one thing we can talk about? Don't make it sick. No, no, no. It's football related. <laughs> yeah, but that's oh, and that doesn't mean it's going to be sick. Um, we uh, do we? Th- so it's there's smoke you know, it's been on, on Maine and not on Maine about the Seahawks. What does that mean? On Maine, you know, on the timeline, whatever, in, in public, publicly and privately. Anyway, smoke and real talk about the Seahawks having been in the the market and trading for a linebacker. Um, oh, yeah. So do we wonder with this Dawson signing, do you think that John and Mike are still theorizing and brainstorming about possibilities out there? What are they trading? Right. I mean, that's a huge A fifth issue. round pick? Yeah. Um, I mean, do they go into 2025 capital? I don't know. The, um, this is just classic. Like, they made a mistake. Like, Well, let's, let's also remember the the Roquan trade was in the middle of the season. So they might be, and then they traded for Williams in the middle of the season when they were working the phones for a defensive tackle all off season last year. Uh, we, we came to learn. So they might be they might be working this for months for all we know um but like there aren't the the problem is there aren't very many good linebackers out there um and some of them are getting old you know jordan brooks turns um let me find this out just to be factually accurate yeah he's the same age as uh me he turns 27 in october just random name here, just throwing a name out there, right? Devin Lloyd turns 26 in September. What? I don't... It, they screwed up, man. Then it's what, just... what, what are they doing? That, that's <laughs> all that's happened. They Why? screwed up. And, and we've seen this before. Like, if they start trying to... Tr- well, I don't know what they're going to give up, but you could just pay your good linebacker. Like, it, it would be that simple. Um... <laughs> But as we said, while Schneider rejected the the kind of scheme uh, reason as a potential explanation for um, not paying Brooks, um, I do think him. I think he was being. I think they could have made more of an effort if they'd wanted to, but I also think they may have been surprised at him not coming back to them, and I definitely think they were shocked. And I think you can believe Schneider when he said that the linebacker market moved quicker than they expected it to. And he mentioned how free agency is hard to peg. It's not the first time that the Seahawks have been caught out by free agency developing fast, as we mentioned the edge group and how uh, the LJ Collier pick happened. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. Interesting (sighs) stuff. (sighs) Griff, closing wisdom. No closing wisdom. I've got no closing. There wisdom. used to be like, see, I can tell you've changed because it used to be. Was it stuff to do with animals at the end of the podcast? And now no, it's no, like no, it's not wisdom though. Well, All right. How about be. this? How about this? How about this? How about how this? How about this? <laughs> they acquired a Sam today. Can they convert him to Mike or Will? Hit it, Maddie.